So I'm going to go ahead quickly, just introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lauren. I am one of the students on Pre-Med Star. I'm a graduate from UC Irvine and applying this cycle as well. So I feel your guys' pain. We're in the same boat, but uh, Megan's going to teach us a bunch tonight. And for those of you who aren't a member of Pre-Med Star, I just really want to push and get you guys to sign up for that because it is such a great resource. So I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen with you guys to go over some of the features of this site here. Okay. So you guys can see now here is my Pre-Med Star dashboard. And uh, real quick, I just want to give a shout out to Aisha. She's been recognized as Pre-Med of the Week. Go ahead and read all about her. She has a super interesting background and is a fantastic writer. So you can see a bunch of her blogs on the site. Um, so just like I said, this is kind of the dashboard. You guys can post any questions you have here about applications. There's tons of medical school recruiters, medical students, other pre-meds on the site who can share all this information with you. And uh, we're gonna go a bit more into detail about what exactly is involved in the medical school application. But real quick, I just wanted to highlight the profile because this comes in handy once you're filling out your medical school application. So for those of you who have started filling out your app, you do know that there is an activity section where you need to go over basically kind of like a list of all of your involvements that show why you'd be a great doctor in the future. So I definitely took advantage of using the profile to kind of put all my information in one place. So you can see here on this profile, you get to edit it, upload your own picture, put a little about me bio, and then you can also list all of your involvements throughout your undergrad education and beyond. So you separate it by volunteer activities, um, extracurriculars, work experience, research, clinical, and it's just kind of like the one-stop shop where you can log everything for your own personal sake and also for recruiters to look at. We do have a lot of active recruiters on the site who are looking at students' profiles and sending them direct messages. So um, just a little bit more incentive for you guys to keep everything up to date. So make sure you guys fill all of this out here. And if you have any questions about what should go on, what shouldn't, um, what you should list as a description, go ahead and just reach out to someone who you see has filled out their profile. Everyone's really happy to help you kind of build your own profile. And uh, one last thing I wanted to go over real quick is just the schools. I did mention that we have some active recruiters on the site here. So you can go ahead and take a look at the school page here to see which sites are actively recruiting on Pre-Med Star. Like I did say earlier, these schools are reaching out to students who have built up their profile. So make sure you throw all your information on there just so you can maybe get your foot in the door once you start to apply. Um, so go ahead and check out these schools. You can even use it to your advantage when you're trying to decide which schools are on your list to apply to by finding out their stats, um, different tuition costs, and just different information about their academics or student body profiles. So always feel free to explore the site to look for all this information and don't be afraid to reach out and connect to anyone on the site. And so thank you so much for sitting through that. Real quick, I'm just gonna ask Megan to come back on the screen so she can go ahead and start her presentation. Um, so everyone welcome, Megan. All right. Hi guys, how's everybody doing? Put it in the chat, thumbs up since we have a few more people now. Hi, hi Grace. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so again, my name is Megan and I am an incoming medical student at Vanderbilt. Super exciting, um, I was in y'all's shoes just a year ago, it's hard to believe it, filling out AMCAS and getting all those letters of recommendation and uh, writing those personal statements. So all the fun stuff. But just know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You will make it through. And I believe in all of you guys that you're going to have a great application cycle. So I do have a little presentation um, to show you guys. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly. Alrighty. It here. Cool. And if you guys have any questions um, as I'm going through, feel free to drop them in the chat. I am able to see the chat too. And Lauren will also help me out and see if there's anything in there. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to walk you guys through my application. 
First things first, I wanted to talk about the fact that there are some different applications out there. So AMCAS, the one I just mentioned, is the American Medical College Application Service. That is run by the AAMC and it's for allopathic medical schools. So this is the one that I used to apply. I applied to allopathic schools this year. Um, and it's the one that I have ex expertise with, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. There is also a COMAS, which is American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine Application Services. Uh, service, a little bit of a mouthful. But that is run by the um, Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine Association, and it's for osteopathic medical schools. Um, there's also one called TIMDAS, and I missed an S in there, but it's Texas Medical and Dental Schools Application Service. So if you're from Texas or you're applying to schools in Texas, make sure that you know that you need to do TIMDAS. Um, if you are applying to Baylor, they do use AMCAS, though, so no worries there. Alrighty, so I mentioned that I'm going to be talking about AMCAS, all the application services out there. There's great resources, though, um, that you can find to help you figure out what you're going to start um, your, or how you're going to start your app. So the first thing that I did was I went to the AAMC's website and they have a tab about applying to medical school. So that was kind of my life during this whole application cycle. Um, and I would click on the how to apply to medical school using AMCAS page. So they have instructions that go step by step through each of the sections. And if there's ever anything that you need to know about logistics or um, just what you should be putting in there, then this section is going to be super duper helpful. But I'll give you a little bit of a rundown of kind of how I went through building my application and what the different sections are and everything here. Alrighty, so there are nine different sections of AMCAS. The first three have to do with your background information, pretty basic stuff like you would put on any um, application to college or medical school, of course. And I'll talk a little bit more in depth about that in a second. There's also coursework. So any class that you've taken at the college level, you're going to have to input that course and what subject it was in, what grade you got, et cetera. I'll show you all that in a minute. Um, with, there's also a work and activities section. So you can put up to 15 work and activities in there. And there's also your letters of evaluation. And uh, you get to choose what medical schools you apply to. It's good news. Um, and you also do your essays in section eight. So that is your personal statement. And section nine is your standardized test, which is basically just your MCAT score for most of us. Um, there, are, there is a section to put other test scores though, like your LSAT or the GRE, if you've taken one of those and you wanna share that info with med schools. Okay, so. Has anyone gone and opened up their AMCAS yet? I think it's open to view and start inputting things, right? But you can't submit yet until June 1st. A few people have. Awesome. So you guys have seen this page then. You know what AMCAS looks like. For anyone who has not, this is kind of the home page. Um, and from here, you can get to all of the different sections. So all of mine are green checks right now, and I can kind of go navigate in between them. You do have to do them. Um, you have to fill out certain sections before you can get to others though. So like you have to do your identifying information before you can continue on. So just make sure you know that. Alrighty. So now I'm gonna go through step-by-step step in the sections, just explain to you again a little bit about what um, is in those sections. And then for the ones that are maybe some things are a little ambiguous, I can explain um, how I dealt with them. And again, feel free to throw questions in the chat, but at the end, I'll also leave some time for questions too. So sections one through three are background info, and section one is just your identifying information, so things like what's your name, where were you born, that sort of stuff. Um, section two is what schools did you attend, so they're going to ask for your high school and any college where you've taken coursework. Um, I put any in all caps because I want to make sure that if you're a student who has taken a uh, kind of collegiate level course in high school, you know that you have to put that you attended that college, you had coursework there. So you'll need to get a transcript from them and you'll also need all of the info about them to put into this section. And then section three is biographic info. Uh, this one takes a little bit of time. Um, so you're gonna need information about all of these things that I have in this little white box here that's straight from AMCAS. Um, so things like your address and citizenship, but also things about what languages you speak, um, any information about your parents and siblings, that sort of stuff. So be prepared to have to get a lot of information going for that section. All right. 
So section four is coursework. Um, this may have been my least favorite section. It took absolutely forever. You can see for um, the University of Mississippi is where I did my undergraduate education. And I, took four, I had taken 49 courses up to that point at Ole Miss. So um, for this section, you hit this little button that says add course. Once you've input um, the colleges that you've gone to, those will pop up here and you just hit add courses under the, those respective ones. And this is just kind of a general idea of what it looks like. You're going to say what year and term you took that course in, what the course was classified in. So whether it was a humanities or a biology or chemistry, um, and that's partly so that they can calculate your kind of math and science GPA as well. Um, you're also going to give the course number, how many credits, et cetera. Um, and they also do have options for you to check if it was an advanced placement course or if it was an honors course as well. Okay, cool. So I think this was the part of the AMCAS that took me the longest. Just be prepared for that. Uh, it's not super hard, but it is tedious. And my pro tip is just to have your transcript pulled up on your computer or sitting next to you. Um, a lot of my friends printed it out and had it sitting next to them and would literally check off every single course that they'd input so that they made sure they didn't miss any. Um, they will get your, when you go through the verification process, once you submit your finalized AMCAS application, they will, AMCAS will go and look at your transcript and uh, actually compare that to the coursework you've put in. So you want to make sure you're as accurate as possible so it doesn't get bounced back to you to fix something. Then let's see. So somebody asked a question about, so do I have to include AP classes I took in high school? So if you took those AP classes in high school and you got college credit for them, then yes, you have to include those AP classes. Um, if you took it, but maybe didn't take the AP test or you didn't get credit for it at your school for some reason, you won't have to include those. But that's kind of the distinction. And if you're not applying this cycle, then you can look at the AMCAS application. I kind of did that a little bit, um, but you won't be able to fill it out and save it until May 1st of your application cycle year. All right, it's cool. Let's see. So section five is work and activities. And here you get uh, up to 15 work and activities sections, and you can choose three of those that are your most meaningful experiences. So I'll explain that a little bit more in a second, but this is just basically what it looks like. Um, and so you will just hit add input, add a work and activities. And um, if you click this little details button, then you get to see some contact information. You have to put in contact information of an advisor or someone who can testify that you actually did that work or activity. And you're also going to have to put in an estimate of about how many hours you spent on that activity as well. And you'll get a little place to explain that, um, what you did. Let's see. Yep. So here I said you can put up to 15 work and activities. So the wisdom is you want quality over quantity of work and activities. So if you participated in 15 activities, but some of those were a club meeting that you went to once freshman year, then you may not want to include those um, on your application. You don't have to include absolutely everything you've ever done. Just choose things that are going to show that you were involved and that you are committed. Um, so things that are like longitudinal are really great. And um, you want to make sure that they're going to paint you in a good light for the fact that you're going to make a great physician too. And so AMCAS does character count rather than word count, which is really fun. I didn't realize that going into my application. Um, so that was an interesting learning curve. Um, but you get 700 characters for each description of your work and activities. And then if you choose one as most meaningful, so you get three of those again, and that's out of your 15, if that makes sense. Um, so you'll get an additional 1325 characters to explain why it was so meaningful to you. All right. And then I also mentioned before that you do need to have the contact info of somebody who can testify. And um, I've had some people ask me about if they can put other students as people who can testify to their involvement. I think I may have done that once or twice if it was um, an organization where maybe I was heavily involved with the executive board, but the advisor was not necessarily super present and involved with the club. Um, I think that that's okay, but just make sure it's going to be somebody who's reliable. And if they did call or email that person, they would testify to the fact that you actually participated. So, all right. And my pro tip for this section is that you can combine similar experiences into one activity. 
So uh, I personally had more than 15 individual things that I wanted to put into my work and activities section, though I didn't have um, a whole lot that I wanted to write for some of those things. Um, so for my shadowing experiences, for example, I didn't want to take up multiple activities with um, my different shadowing experiences, though I probably could write a lot about each of them. So instead, let's see if I have this here. Instead, I did multiple shadowing experiences into one. So I just called this entry shadowing experiences and um, I put the contact information and um, all of that for the first person kind of in the boxes that they have. And then um, on where it says also, that is where I put that in the description box. Um, and where those little bars are is just where the contact information of my people was. I didn't want their emails kind of out there for the world to see. Um, but that's, I've seen a lot of people do this and I think it's a great way to um, just condense a lot of things, especially shadow me experiences, or maybe you want to list out your awards and scholarships you've gotten, but you don't have a ton to say about those. Um, this is a great way to kind of put them all into one. All right, let's go back to this one here. Okay, so here's an example of one of my activity descriptions. I know when I first started uh, working on my application, I had absolutely no idea what I was supposed to write about what I had done. So here I wanted to give you guys an example of one that I did. And I was an Ole Miss ambassador when I was at Ole Miss, so basically a campus tour guide for prospective students. Um, and here's what I had to say about it. So this group is comprised of students selected by application and two rounds of interviews for their passion and leadership ability. I participate in recruiting events, give tours of campus, and correspond with prospective students. Being an ambassador affords the chance to interact with people from a wide variety of backgrounds. I have given a tour to a school group from a rural Mississippi town one day, then a family from New York the next. On some tours, I have even become an unofficial career counselor while conversing with potential free house students. As a result, I'm practicing quickly relating to others, being flexible in dynamic situations, and making anyone feel at ease. So how I came to that was basically um, I got some advice from people who came before me and my mentors <clears throat> that you want to concisely explain what the organization is, what your role in the organization is, what impact you've had on um, the larger community or that organization in particular, and then tie it back to how that's going to make you a good physician. So if you look at that last sentence, um, it talks about quickly relating to others, being flexible in dynamic situations and making anyone feel at ease. I think that could just as easily be applied to giving a campus tour as it could to interacting with a patient in a clinical setting. Um, so not every single entry has to be like that and don't agonize over them too, too much. But I think that that's a good general framework to kind of help you figure out what exactly you want to say. You don't want to just um, explain all of your duties and talk about how if you were secretary, you wrote this many emails, um, talk about your organizational skills and talk about how that ties back to medicine. All right, cool. So then section six is for letters of evaluation. Hopefully you guys have in mind some of the professors or uh, mentors or anybody that you are going to get letters of evaluation from. And my advice for this is do your research on how many and what kinds of letters each school wants from you. So figure out first which school, medical schools you're going to apply to, then do your research on those schools. Pretty much every single school that I applied to had different requirements about what kinds of people and how many letters they wanted from you, which can seem a little crazy, but if you put it in an Excel spreadsheet, you'll get it figured out. Um, so I know most of the schools that I applied to wanted two science professors. So I kind of had that in mind and I knew that that was um, something that I needed to get. Then when I started looking at more and more schools, there were some that allowed me to put in up to five or six recommenders. Um, and so I had to pick and choose who I wanted those recommenders to be. And again, quality over quantity. So you want someone who's going to know you really well and be able to speak to your ability to be a great doctor in the future. Um, I, some of the people I asked for my letters of recommendation were um, people that I had worked with in internships. And one of um, my mentors who I've worked closely with for years, and he is also a physician, so he knows me and medicine really well, which is helpful. 
Um, I also, I'm an, I was an economics major, and so there were a few schools that wanted a letter from a professor in my major. And um, so I had my thesis advisor, thankfully, was an economics professor, and he was able to write me a letter of recommendation. Um, so if you're a non STEM major, non-science major, make sure you look out for those schools that are going to want uh, letters of recommendation from people in your department. And they, a lot of schools, um, especially if they have a research emphasis, will want your research preceptor to be a recommender as well. So just figure out what all the uh, letters they want and make sure that you ask your recommenders early. So if you haven't already asked them, I would highly, highly suggest that you go ahead and reach out to them. And different people have different ways of asking. Um, I don't think there's one perfect way. I would say definitely um, show your appreciation and tell them that you really believe that uh, they would write a great letter and you want to ask them if they're going to be able to write a strong letter of recommendation for you. You don't just want someone to write a letter that's like, yeah, this person was in my class. It was uh, pretty cool. They showed up every once in a while. You want someone who's going to know you very well and know your work ethic um, and be able to attest to that. All right, that's all for that one. So section seven kind of funnily comes after your recommenders. Um, so in section seven, you're going to choose which medical schools you want to apply to. Um, so there's a lot of things you could say on this topic, but basically my overarching advice is just do your homework. Um, so MSAR is a great resource if you guys have ever heard of that. And uh, it is available on the AAMC's website. It basically gives you information on average MCAT scores, how many in-state versus out-of-state people they take, what the tuition is like, how many volunteer hours people had on average. Um, so it's a great compilation of information and it's going to let you know what or how you might fit with that school. Um, also, I would suggest in addition to looking at just the statistics, make sure you're looking at what the school's mission is and a lot of the things that the school is involved in too. So if you're someone who really wants to do a lot of research, make sure that the schools that you're applying to have a research emphasis. Um, if you're somebody who really wants primary care, then make sure that those schools have great primary care resources too, that kind of thing. Um, personally, I'm really interested in innovation and technology. So a lot of the schools that I applied to are on the cutting edge with a lot of that stuff. And somebody just asked, is the MSAR a free resource? So MSAR is sadly not free. I think that you can do a trial of it. Um, it is pretty reasonable though. It's only like 20 or 20, I think it was $25 when I did it last year. Um, probably best $25 I've ever spent though because otherwise you'll spend hours and hours looking for that information. Um, and sometimes that information is not even available on the school's website. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile, I think, to get it. I believe if you have a fee waiver for AMCAS, you may be able to get a reduced price on MSAR too. $28 now, awesome, thank you for looking. Cool, okay, so also when you're looking around at what schools and how many schools to apply to, remember that it is expensive to apply. So every school that you check on this list, there's going to be an application fee through AMCAS to send it to them. And you're also going to have to pay that school's secondary application fee, uh, which can range anywhere from like $50 to $120. Um, so do your research there on how much their secondary ops cost too so that you can budget. And I would highly suggest only applying to schools where you would actually consider attending and where you have a shot at getting in. Um, I know some people talk about, oh, I'm only gonna apply to the top 10 schools. And in reality, even if they got into a couple of, if they got into a couple of those top 10 schools, there are a few that they wouldn't go to even if they got in. So to me, that seems like a little bit of a waste of time and money. Um, but also look at kind of their statistics and everything and make sure that you have a shot at getting into. Um, so I think that there's no shame in having a couple reach schools and a couple safety schools, um, but have as many as possible within your application pool of schools that you will have a possible shot at getting into. Um, so personally, I had a few reach schools and then I also did a lot of possible schools um, that had similar kind of MCAT scores and GPAs and involvement, that kind of thing. All right, and oh, you can see on this little MCAS screenshot here that you get to select uh, which recommenders are gonna give you the, uh, letters for that school. And then here this tells you that they, this yes tells you that they're participating in the uh, letters of evaluation service through AMCAS and pretty much all schools that are on AMCAS do. And then this second one is uh, whether or not that school does a criminal background check. So 
There are some schools that don't do a criminal background check on people before they matriculate, but most schools do. So just be aware of that. Um, and they also tell you the deadline for recommenders and um, yeah, deadline for when recommendations have to be in and when your secondary application has to be in too. So helpful information there. All right, so section eight is about your essays. So this is your personal statement. And there's a bajillion things you go on for hours talking about the personal statement. Um, thankfully, there's lots and lots of resources out there um, for you to look at, including a past webinar from PreMedStar. So go check that out. Um, and I would suggest once you've looked at all those resources and written your personal statement, get it into a final draft on some sort of Word documents or, you know, Google Docs, and then copy and paste it into AMCAS. So um, don't try to write, and this probably goes for work and activities too, I wouldn't try to write your work and activities or your personal statement within the application. Use copy and paste. Um, it'll work out just fine. Usually the spacing doesn't get off too terribly, um, but that's probably a lot better idea. Okay, then section nine is standardized tests. So I mentioned this is where your MCAT score goes. They do this really great thing since the MCAT is through AAMC as well. There, your score is automatically imported. Um, so you can go check that out. They have all of the percentages, what percentile you were in and your score. Um, and this is where all of your MCAT scores will go. So if you've taken it more than once, they will have all of those listed. And if you've already taken the MCAT, but you're not happy with your score and you're going to take it again, you can select that as an option so that schools who are reviewing your application will know, oh, hey, this person is going to take the MCAT again. Let's flag their application so that we can come back and look once they've taken it. Um, they'll ask you when you're going to sit for it so that the schools know too. And if you're just a really awesome person and you've already taken the LSAT or the GRE or the GMAT, then you can certainly add those scores in there as well if um, they're competitive and you want schools to see them. So good deal, but you certainly don't have to add them if you don't want to. And I think I saw a question about the MCAT over here. Uh, speaking of the MCAT, what is the latest you think you could take the MCAT and still have a decent chance at admission this cycle? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, so I think the general wisdom is apply as early as possible to have the best chance because many schools are on a rolling application cycle. Um, I would say that if you take it sometime during the summer, you're probably going to be okay because they're still very much in the process of reviewing a lot of applications um, and yours will probably still be in the mix of consideration with everybody and a lot of people do take it over the summer. Uh, if you get past, I would think if you get past August, September, maybe in September um, would probably be the latest, the absolute latest you would want to take it because uh, invitations for interviews start going out in October. So in order to be one of the people kind of on their list for interview invites, they only have a certain number of slots, I would highly suggest having it your, probably having your score back in September. So maybe taking it August at the latest. Certainly not to say that you couldn't take the MCAT in the fall um, and still get into medical school and have a great application cycle, but I think if you want to have the best chance possible, try to do it as early as you can. Hopefully that answers your question. All right. Well, that's all I have as far as a presentation for you guys. Um, but what questions do you all have for me? Okay, Megan, thanks for sharing that. Um, real quick, I just want to hop in and let you guys know that there is a poll question posted. So if you guys can just go ahead and answer which of those two factors is most important to you right now in your pre-med journey. Um, and then we will go ahead and answer the rest of the questions that came in. Right. And then uh, Megan, there was a, oh, two now two or three that have popped up in the chat. And then we have a few inside the Q&A to answer as well. Awesome, good deal. Okay, so the one that I see, or a couple I see in the chat right now, what was the hardest part of your application process? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the hardest part of the application process for me was actually the secondaries. Um, so I know that I didn't talk about this in um, AMCAS, in this whole AMCAS presentation necessarily, but uh, once you submit, you will start getting, hopefully, some invitations to fill out secondaries. And 
uh, the wisdom around those is that you generally want to get them in as soon as possible and hopefully no later than two weeks. So I am a person who really likes to make sure that all of my writing is exactly how I want it to be. And because I applied to a lot of schools, um, I had kind of a time crunch when a lot of those came in at once. And so it was a little bit stressful to me for me to manage my internship and also filling out these secondaries and getting ready for school. So uh, if you have good time management skills, though, you'll be fine. But that was the hardest part for me. And then how did you approach your personal statements? Okay, so there's, gosh, there's um, so many different ways I think that you can approach your personal statement. I think for me, personally, um, I got some good advice to think about three to five events or things that changed my outlook on life. And they did not have to be related to medicine. Uh, actually, some of it was better if it wasn't related to medicine. And once I thought about those three things and really kind of figured out what they changed about my perspective, I was able to sit down and write out a kind of not even necessarily in sequential order, but just what those things were, um, how they impacted me, and how they've changed me and sort of brought me into medicine. Um, so yeah, that was kind of how I did mine and lots of reviewing, of course, reviewing with myself, reviewing with other people. Um, don't let too many people look at your personal statement because you'll get conflicting opinions, but use a few trusted people. Okay, uh, can you go through an example on the work and experience an activity section where you had multiple experiences under one activity. Okay, so I think that um, for that one, let me see if I can go back and share my screen here. Ah, oh, so many things on here. All right, so here's an example of uh, when I had multiple in one. So yeah, you can see that um, you of course want to make sure that you still have all of the things that they ask for. So you fill it out basically just like you would um, the informational parts for any work and activities. So you're going to have how many hours it was, what the dates were of that activity, um, maybe a short explanation of what it was, and a contact person for that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that helps. Okay. I'm going to go back to, let's see, I'm going to look at the Q&A really quickly so I don't miss out on any of those guys. Uh, is there a way to prep ahead for secondaries? Uh, so yes and no. There, there are some resources out there that you can find um, that have old secondary questions on there. I would caution you to use those judiciously. Some schools don't change their secondary questions at all from year to year. Some schools change them every year. Um, so as much as I hate to say, maybe ask on some forums, but if you can kind of do some research and figure out which schools change their questions and which don't, you can probably find um, some secondaries that you can prepare answers to. I would say um, general, a lot of the secondary questions, if you look at them, have similar kind of vibes to them, if that, <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, but once you write a few, once you write a few of the secondaries, you'll be able to use a lot of the same uh, verbiage, verbiage in them. So hopefully that, hopefully that helps. How long did it take you to write your personal statement? Uh, a long time. It took me, I started in April, which honestly, I feel like was personally too late because I take forever to write things. Um, and it took me until around June 2nd or 3rd to actually get it all finalized. So a few months. Uh, let's see. If you use one activity for multiple physicians but have no characters left to add contact info, is it okay to select just one physician to the list? I think so. Um, I, for my ones that had multiple physicians, um, typically it was some sort of shadowing program, and so I just put the director of that program. Um, so if that's applicable to you, I think that's a fine way to do that. Where can you find how many letters are needed for each school? Yeah, so go and check on the school's webpage. Um, all of the schools have some sort of like prospective students page and you can look on there at their letters of evaluation and they'll tell you exactly which ones they want. Uh, let's see, so MedStart page is beneficial since you can basically write out your application and have it ready for when the cycle opens. Uh, let's see, so I think that um, if you're talking about pre-MedStar, pre-MedStar is a way to connect with um, 
other pre-meds. And yes, there is, when you're doing filling out the work and activities, there are a lot of similarities. Um, so if you want to treat it like you're doing your AMCAS application, basically, I would say absolutely more power to you. You're going to save a lot of time when May 1st rolls around and you're starting to fill all that stuff out. It's a very good point. Okay. Should I include study abroad courses? Ooh, okay. So I did not study abroad, um, but that is a really good point. Um, so I had some friends who studied abroad. And if you go look at that AMCAS, AMCAS. Or, or, oh, the double AMC page, then you will be able to see um, they have a whole kind of guidelines about study abroad courses. I'm pretty sure you do include them if you got credit at your institution. Yeah. So actually I can hop in and answer this question because I did actually study abroad during undergrad. Um, there's two different ways that it could go. Um, if it's through a formal program through your undergrad institution, then you just list it with wherever you studied at, and then you do not need to request a transcript. However, if you ended up seeking out this opportunity on your own, or it was through an outside organization not affiliated with your school, you do have to request a transcript from that university. So keep that in mind when you're applying, because then you will have to request an application from your undergrad institution and the university wherever you studied abroad. So um, if you have any more questions on how do you know if you need to request a transcript or not, check out, uh, I can post a resource inside the chat from the double AMC, but it kind of walks you through how you know exactly what information you need to get from where you studied abroad. Yeah, thanks for jumping in and answering that one. That was a good question. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, so somebody in the chat said, does it hurt to submit with an old MCAT score when you plan on taking it again? Should I just wait to submit? I would go ahead and submit, um, but make sure you check the box that says you're going to be taking it again. Um, I don't believe that they're going to penalize you if you have um, a lower score than you'd like to if you say that you're going to take it again. Um, it, may, it may depend on when you're going to take it as well. So if you'd be able to submit sometime in June or maybe early July, then you can definitely wait until um, your new MCAT score comes in if you want it to be on there already. But um, if you're going to wait to take it any longer than that, I would say it's probably more beneficial to you to go ahead and get your application in their hands um, and let them go through their process first um, and they'll, they'll figure out what your MCAT score um, is once it comes in. Hopefully that answers that. Okay, so somebody said, how long does it take to hear back if you're invited to an interview? So this varies widely from school to school. And so first, after you submit your AMCAS, you'll hopefully get an invitation to fill out a secondary. Some schools pre-screen um, in between you submitting your AMCAS and them sending you a secondary. So they will actually cut down on um, the number of students. So like say a thousand students apply to one medical school and they pre-screen. They may only send out secondaries to 500 of those 1,000 students. Um, and then of those 500 students, once they fill out their secondary, then they will either be invited to an interview or not. So uh, since the process looks different for every single school, the time frame is going to be very different for each school as well. Um, I had some schools who actually had a timeline. They said, you know, if you submit your secondary by this date, you will know by this date um, that you have an interview or you don't. But there were also schools that I um, submitted my secondary in July and I was still waiting into December to figure out if they were going to give me an interview slot or not. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it can be a little frustrating, but just have patience. <laughs> You'll figure it out eventually. Um, let's see. My pre-med advisor will be submitting a committee letter. Is there any case where my school does, our school does not require this and how would I go about submitting single rec letters? So I think that Lauren, does your school do a committee letter? My school does not. Okay. My school does not either. So I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this question. Um, but I believe that if your school does uh, do a committee letter, then you should utilize that, com that committee letter um, if at all possible. And if you think it's going to be helpful to you, um, there is, I know there's a box in MCAS, I remember that um, says, 
does your school do committee letters? And if you, if they do committee letters and you're choosing not to use it, then you need to explain why. So uh, I would say that that could maybe count against you if you do have a program like that. Um, but I believe that for some schools that it, it depends on the school, but for some schools that counts as all of your letters and for some schools that counts as just one. And then you can also submit single rec letters. Cool. So I would say look at the schools for an individual basis on that. Um, and yes, my personal statement is on pre-med star and Docshare. If you guys want to go check it out. Super fun. Um, so if you went through an outside group, but the credits transferred back to your home institution, you need a transcript. Yes, I think, right. That was kind of the study abroad question as well. Um, let's see if, if when you check your official transcript from your undergrad institution, if it lists your study abroad credits, typically you won't need to get a transcript from um, your university abroad. But I did post that little link inside of the chat here if you guys see it and it goes through what if this, what if that. Um, so it'll be really specific to your exact case and you'll be able to figure out if you do or do not need to request another transcript. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so here's another kind of transcript question. I took three courses as part of a summer program but I did not receive credit or grades. I don't think I got an official, I could get an official transcript. So I think if you did not receive credit or grades for them, um, then it's okay to not include them. If um, I would, I would go check out that resource that Lauren has up there as well. Um, but yeah, I think if they didn't transfer back for credit at any sort of program, then you're probably okay. Um, how long does the verification process take? So this, uh, this can vary as well, depending on when you submit it. So if you submit on June 1st, I think that typically it takes them between two and five weeks, kind of depending. Um, someone who's submitting right now may know more um, about that than me. But I think that generally they do it pretty quickly. Last, when I submitted it, I got it back a lot faster than I expected to. I think I submitted on June 3rd or 4th because I was still working on my personal statement and I ended up getting it back in um, mid-June. So it was, it was pretty early. And um, let's see here. I think that a lot of schools don't start sending out secondaries until July 1st though. So as long as you're kind of in before then and you're able to let schools review, then you should be okay. Um, what are common things that cause delays with AMCAS? So definitely inputting your coursework incorrectly is a big thing that causes delays. If you, if the grade that you put input in the coursework section does not match the grade on your transcript, they're going to send it back to you. Um, they also, for my, a couple of mine, um, I got verified. I didn't have any problems with it, but a few of mine, they had questions about what um, the subject area that I selected for a couple courses, just because I think the name was slightly ambiguous of the course code. It was like an honors course for my thesis. And so they just weren't sure where it belonged, um, but they just kind of marked it as ambiguous and let it go through. Um, I think that as long as you don't have any super egregious errors, it, they'll probably be okay with it. Um, I would say fill it out to the best of your ability and try to make sure that everything is accurate, double, triple check it. Um, but I think that that's probably the biggest thing that would cause delays is just anything not matching a transcript or some, or a, if you're inputting identifying information incorrectly and they're able to check that, then that's gonna cause issues. Okay. Let's see what else we got in the Q and A over here. Uh, can you repeat similar ideas, stories, personal events, and secondary questions and essays? Um, so I think that that sort of depends on what frame you're coming from. So I think that you can certainly repeat similar ideas um, in a, your personal statement and your secondary applications. I would try really hard not to repeat the same stories um, or harp on the same things, if that makes sense. Um, try to show that you have a breadth of experience, but you certainly want to be a coherent applicant, right? So if you're repeating similar ideas, like I mentioned before that I'm very interested in technology. So for me, that was a highlight of a lot of my personal statement and also my secondary applications and all those things. Um, so totally okay to repeat similar ideas, maybe not stories. Um, and if you're talking about school to school, 
they they won't see each other's secondary applications. So even if you if there's the same secondary question on two schools, you can copy and paste and they will be none the wiser. So you just saved yourself a bunch of time by doing that. All right, cool. Let's see what else is there. What strategies did you use to differentiate yourself compared to other applicants? Because uh, other applicants have also done shadowing, blood sharing, et cetera. That's a really good question. Um, so I think you kind of have to dig deep into yourself, right, and figure out uh, what makes you different? What unique interests do you have? Um, what angle kind of do you bring to medicine? Um, I have some friends who are from very rural rural communities and they did not have great access to care. And so their angle was they want to help those communities get better access to care by becoming a physician themselves. And um, they talked about that with all of their experiences. Of course, their experiences supported that. For me, mine was um, about innovation. So a lot of my internships and um, my research and things have been very focused on innovation within medicine, especially as it relates to advanced technology. Um, and so I didn't really intend for that to kind of be my, I, I didn't come in as a freshman to college saying, oh, I'm going to be, you know, innovation is going to be my angle for differentiating, differentiating myself. Um, but if you can find, I think if you find something that you're passionate about and interested in, and you can support that with your activities, um, that's how you're going to differentiate yourself. So don't worry too much about it, but figure out what your passion is because you're right. Everybody's going to have shadowing experiences and uh, everybody's going to have volunteer experiences. Okay, let's see. Can you list a family member for shadowing experiences? I believe that you can um, as long as you actually did shadow that family member. I think that um, I mean, if you did that as an activity, then that's a perfectly acceptable thing. Um, I think where it gets to be tricky is when people start asking about letters of recommendation from family members, that can be kind of a gray zone. So I would say maybe be wary about that. But I think it's perfectly fine if you did shadow a family member to list them as your contact person for that. Does the school or AMCAS contact your references? Um, so I think that they reserve all rights to contact those references. They did not contact any of mine, um, but that's not to say that they never would. So I think that you should go in expecting that they will contact absolutely everyone on that list. Um, and that, so I would say you should probably let them know that, they, um, that you're putting them on your AMCAS application, just in case. Because I mean, wouldn't that be the worst if AMCAS does call them and say, hey, we want to know if this student um, actually participated in this organization. And they're like, oh, what? I didn't even know that you had my phone number, right? You want them to be fully prepared and say, oh, yes, absolutely. They told me they were fine in medical school, so. Okay, should we expect to be asked what specialty we're interested in in secondary applications and interviews? Oh, that's a good question. I think that that kind of depends on the school as well. Um, I got asked that question a few times and I had varying advice on how to answer it per se. Um, for me personally, I'm not super invested in one specialty just yet. I have some inklings of what I might want to do, but basically I just told them that, that um, I was interested in a certain different, a couple different areas for these reasons, but I was so excited to explore all of the opportunities that I was going to get in medical school and knew that a lot of people changed their mind a lot. Um, so I think that that's an okay way to answer that. If you are like absolutely dead set on neurosurgery and all of your stuff in your application supports that, um, I think it's okay to talk about that. I would say maybe don't bring it up yourself, but if you get asked about it and um, that's something that you're really passionate about, then be true to yourself. Uh, they probably won't ask about it on secondary applications though. I think I've only ever seen that in interviews. So why would you use a committee letter, but how do you know if it will be as strong as individual letters? So I am not entirely sure how the committee letters work since my school did not do them. Um, I think different schools do it differently. Usually it's a pre-health advisor gives kind of their overall recommendation about the student and they will often have professors on the committee as the recommenders. So they will write individual letters about you. Um, but again, that could vary from school to school. So if your school does a committee letter, I would suggest reaching out to your health professions advising office and talking to them about what exactly theirs looks like. Okay, so what if one's motive to pursue medicine is faith-based and or personal experience? What would that be appropriate? I think that 
absolutely, you need to be true to yourself about why you are pursuing medicine as a career. Um, I think that you should know going in that that may be more well received by some schools than others. And that's okay. But if that's really what's important to you, then look at the school's mission statements, um, look at the types of activities they have available. And if what you, the reason you're going into medicine is aligned with their mission, that's probably going to be a great thing to talk about for you. Um, I struggled a little bit. So if you guys read my personal statement, you'll see that I um, struggled with an eating disorder and I was in treatment for that. And for a long time, I went back and forth with my mentor about whether or not that would be appropriate to include because I was worried that medical schools would view me as weaker because I had struggled with a mental illness. Um, so ultimately, I ended up deciding to put it on my application because I felt it was a large part of who I was and of why I decided to pursue medicine. Um, so I think that if that is true for you as well, then I would say go ahead and do it. Be careful about um, how you're presenting that, but I think if you're doing it for the right reasons, then that's gonna be okay. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay, um, so there's a question from Facebook. How much weight do they put on grades we received in college classes we took during high school? You know, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think that that probably varies from school to school because they can arrange your coursework to see um, kind of which ones you took in college versus high school. They'll see that there's a difference. Um, they probably will put more weight on, I'm guessing, science classes and um, the more difficult classes you've taken in college, but I don't think that they're going to um, penalize you if you took a class in high school and maybe your grade wasn't exactly what you wanted it to be. I know for me, when I took um, classes in high school that counted for college credit, a lot of them just uh, showed up as pass-fail on my transcript. I'm not sure if that's true for you too, um, but I would say I wouldn't worry about it too, too much if you've done well in most of your courses um, in college, but definitely make sure that you put those grades um, that you got for college classes that you took during high school on your transcript as well um, so that your application is complete. Okay, do we have any other questions? You see I missed. Um, I don't see any that were missed. Um, okay. Why don't you guys go ahead and throw any last minute questions you have inside the chat or the q and A? I just want to remind all of you, feel free to connect with Megan on Pre-Med Star. She is active on the site, so you guys can go ahead and find her and get any advice from her as well. Um, a few of you have asked where you can find her personal statement. You guys do need a Pre-Med Star account for that. But if you just go to DocShare, you will be able to see that she shared it with everyone. Um, on there for you guys to use just to see her experiences and how she decided to go about phrasing her personal statement. So don't be afraid to go check all those out. And um, I actually do see a couple of questions are coming in here real quick. So um, Divya is asking, what is the hardest part of the MD school interview? All right. Um, so the hardest part, Ooh, that's a tough question. I think all of my interviews were very different. Um, and so maybe the hardest part was kind of figuring out how to set expectations and um, what exactly I was walking into. Some schools, for example, will do their interviews right off the bat. So as soon as you walk in at eight in the morning, they'll hand you your um, list of people that are interviewing you and you go straight to their offices and get interviewed. And some people, you had a bunch of presentations all throughout the morning and talk to students. And then in the afternoon, you got to do interviews. Um, so I think for me, kind of adapting to, the, to that may have been um, the toughest part. And let's see, I think also just kind of personally, some people have asked me like the toughest questions that I've been asked. Um, for me, it was basically, I'm a business major. And so I got asked a lot, why are you a business major and you're going into medicine? And that's kind of a tricky question to answer because a, a lot of people I think are suspicious of um, students who are business majors that are going into med school, they're worried that we're just going to leave the profession and uh, go into administration. Um, so I had a lot of counseling on how to kind of walk around to that question. Um, that was probably the hardest one for me. Okay, let's see. How did you handle tricky MMI or traditional interview questions for MD schools? So I actually did not have the experience of uh, interviewing at any MMI schools. I had some friends who did and they had some uh, different experiences. I think that the hardest ones that they told me about were when they had to role play with a patient who was being difficult 
And uh, so they had to kind of just on the fly figure out how to calm that patient down or talk to them about something that they really didn't know that much about. Um, and there was a person watching them do that. So that was kind of the trickiest one. But they said, if you're, they're not really looking for you to handle the situation like perfectly, they just want to see that you're not going to get flustered, that you're going to continue to try to problem solve and figure out what's working and what's not. And uh, for tricky traditional interview questions, I would say take a breath before you answer that question. Um, so if they ask you something that's maybe like a controversial topic or like when they ask me my question about being a business major, I would always just kind of like take a deep breath and prepare to answer it um, so that you kind of gather your thoughts together. And um, yeah, I think that that's kind of my general advice. I would say no going into it. Now, there will probably be lots of other webinars about interviews and stuff, um, but the best advice I ever got about interviewing with traditional interviews was know when you're going in there what three things you want that interviewer to take out that about you. Um, and so I had those things written in the back of my notebook that I took with me to every interview, and I made sure that in every interview I went to, I kind of drove the conversation into them knowing those three things about me. All right. How should one balance applying to DO, MD, and Texas schools? I think that that's a pretty personal question. Um, DO, the, so osteopathic and allopathic medical schools um, are both have similar professions, of course, but they both have um, varying kind of perspectives, which is really, it's very cool to um, look into. And so I think that you have to figure out which path you fit with. Um, not that you have to choose one or the other, but um, that could maybe help you figure out the balance. So if you're more inclined to go to an allopathic school, maybe apply to more allopathic schools. Um, but if you're really wanting the DO route, maybe go mostly DO. And then Texas schools, um, if you're not a Texas resident, I would say do your research. I'm not sure. There's some schools that do not allow non-residents of the state to uh, apply there. So I go to school at Ole Miss, for example, and Mississippi is one uh, state where you cannot go to their medical school if you're not a state resident. So it's a same-ish thing for some Texas schools. Um, and like I mentioned before, Baylor is on AMCAS, so you won't have to do Tim Das either. Okay. Anything else? Okay, so Mary's wondering, uh, during interviews, were you given any questions where you had a difficult time answering? If so, what was the question? Uh, so there's one that sticks out in my mind in particular, and um, I had a professor ask me, okay, so when you are 50 years old, where do you see yourself? And he gave me no direction other than that. And I was thrown off a little bit because most of the time uh, people will just kind of ask probing questions about like, oh, what specialties are you interested in? Or uh, what do you want to be involved in when you come to medical school? That kind of thing. Um, so I was a little thrown off. I was like, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I kind of like tried to ask him a little bit um, of questions. And he was like, no, no, where do you want to see your, where do you see yourself in 50 years? And so I had to kind of talk myself through, okay, well, I think that, you know, I want to go into residency and then I want to hopefully do some research. I can see myself at an academic medical center maybe. I don't think that I did the best job answering that question. Um, so that's what sticks out in my mind. Um, I think just kind of know yourself and realize that you won't answer every question personally or perfectly. But yeah, that was the hardest one for me. Um, what are some questions that took you off guard? So yeah, that one about uh, where do you see yourself? And I'm trying to think what other ones I asked me about. One that didn't necessarily throw me off guard, but um, something that I never really expected to be asked in a medical school interview was, okay, so suppose that there's a world where disease doesn't exist and there are no healthcare professionals at all. What would you do? And so you had to figure out like, oh, well, what would I do? And I, I was kind of, I kind of surprised myself that I answered right off the bat very quickly. I was like, oh, it'd be a dance teacher because that's something that I'm super passionate about. And um, that's evident in my application as well. And so we got to talking about that and about being a ski instructor too, and just had a great conversation. Um, that was something that kind of sort of surprised me too, is that different interviewers um, are very different. So <laughs> obviously they, um, some will be very conversational and some have kind of a checklist of all the questions they have to ask. So uh, once you kind of feel out that vibe of what the interview is going to be like, you can kind of figure out if you're going to get thrown a curveball question or if it's going to be very conversational and flow in a pretty normal manner. Okay. Is there anything else? What's the best advice you received in your med school admissions journey? 
Um, I think the best advice I received was look at how closely the school's mission statement aligns with your own. Um, and I think that throughout the whole application process, like I went back and forth on, oh, what's my top school? Which school do I want to be most at? And I think that you can get kind of distracted by statistics and their ranking in the research uh, you know, field and that sort of thing. Um, but ultimately what it came back to every time um, and what ultimately my decision came down to was how closely does their mission statement align with my own? Okay, perfect. So we are actually um, right at the hour now. So Megan, I just want to say thank you again for sharing all of your tricks and uh, information that you learned from your application cycle. Uh, we all really appreciate it and we're excited to follow your journey as you matriculate this summer. So um, once again, congratulations on your acceptance and we hope you enjoy your last summer. We weren't able to answer everyone's questions, so if you guys still have a few things that you want to know from us, go ahead and connect on the site and reach out. We are always happy to share any information with you guys. So um, thanks for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your night. Yeah, thank you guys.